in 1877, Charcot, the great French neurologist, called the shaking palsy Maladie de Parkinson, thereby linking the name of the Shoreditch physician with the disease he had described 60 years earlier. Appointed to the parish of St. Leonard's, James Parkinson was a keen observer of the natural world, the political world, and what was then the fast-evolving world of medicine and disease. It was amongst the hectic milieu of inner East London in the early 19th century that James Parkinson recognised the clinical features which are synonymous with the disease which bears his name. This is one of the pamphlets published by Parkinson in 1817, now housed at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. An essay on the shaking palsy could have been bought for two or three pence. It starts with an almost apologetic preface asking the reader to forgive the author's lack of experimental evidence and pathological examination. In chapter one, James Parkinson defines the disease. Involuntary tremulous motion with less than muscular power in parts not in action and even when supported with a propensity to bend the trunk forwards and to pass from a walking to a running pace, the senses and intellects being uninjured. He then contends for the first time that the palsy and the tremor are part of the disease and are not simply non-specific symptoms. He reports six illustrative cases. Three were patients treated in his own practice in Hoxton Square. Two were gentlemen he casually met on the street and took the opportunity to speak to. And the sixth was a gentleman only observed at a distance across the busy market streets of Shoreditch, East London. James, the son of a surgeon, was born in 1755 in Hoxton Square, where his father worked and dispensed medicines. He was baptised in St Leonard's Church on April the 29th. The north of Shoreditch was a fashionable residential area populated by religious, academic, scientific and literary figures. Initially with large houses, fashionable squares and numerous almshouses, from the late 18th century was transformed by industrial development and a large number of people, many of them poor, who came to live and work in the area. The transitory life of these labourers and masons who stayed at the local almshouses would have made it unlikely that James could long follow up many of his patients. Number one Hoxton Square, where James was born, lived and practised, had three storeys and a basement, large rooms, fine arches and fireplaces. James would have been able to look out over the private garden in the square, see the spire of St Leonard's Church, observe the ladies and gentlemen parading round the square and glimpse the dingy courtyards around the square's margins. Modern Hoxton Square retains little that would have been recognisable to Parkinson. A mixture of buildings now line the square. Number 32 has been restored, while 31 and 37 retain traces of the 1680s original houses. The central garden was made into a public park in 1916. It's only a short walk from Hoxton Square to St Leonard's Church, where James was married in 1781. He qualified as a medical practitioner in Edinburgh four years later and attended lectures in surgery at the London Hospital in Whitechapel. Throughout his studies, he developed a keen interest in general science and natural phenomena. In 1787, he was called to a house in Crabtree Row, not far from the church. A lightning strike had fatally injured two occupants and a bystander. Parkinson noticed an unusual black and pink discoloration of their extremities. The following year, he published his first scientific paper on the effects of lightning. He was a strong advocate for the underprivileged and probably also of the French Revolution. 
Parkinson's early career was overshadowed by his involvement in a variety of social and revolutionary causes. He published numerous pamphlets under the pen name of Old Hubert that could be bought in St James Square for a penny. Parkinson advocated reform and representation of the people in the House of Commons. He was a member of several secret political societies, including the London Corresponding Society for Reform of Parliamentary Representation. In 1794, the society was charged with complicity in an alleged plot to murder King George III, the so-called Popgun Plot, and he narrowly avoided conviction for treason. In 1799, James was elected by the local parishioners of St. Leonard's to fill the post of trustee for the poor for the liberty of Hoxton. He was responsible for raising funds for the Sunday school and was instrumental in the construction of the building in 1814. Even with his mounting responsibilities, Parkinson was able to develop his interest in paleontology and geology. He frequently visited the collection of natural artefacts and fossils left to the newly established Royal College of Surgeons in Lincoln's Inn Fields by the surgeon John Hunter. The college was formed in 1800 after receiving the Royal Charter and the original building which housed the Hunterian collection and library was constructed here in 1813, but was rebuilt in 1833. In 1804, James published the first volume of his best-known geological work, Organic Remains of the Former World. The cost was 10 guineas, and it was soon considered one of the leading references in paleontology, and will have no doubt been an important reference for Charles Darwin's observations half a century later. Many of the fossils collected by Parkinson are still housed at museums around the country. Two oolite fossils, the crinoid apiocrinus parkinsoni and the ammonite parkinsonia parkinsoni, have been named after him. It was here, in Great Queen Street, Hoban, that in 1807, the Royal Geological Society was born over dinner at the Freemasons' Tavern. James was one of the founding members at that dinner, although the tavern is long since demolished. It was replaced by a larger building originally called the Freemasons' Tavern, and now known as the Connaught Rooms, where in 1863 the Football Association was founded and the rules of the beautiful game formulated. As part of his responsibilities to the parish of St. Leonard's, James Parkinson attended the local madhouses. Barnes House, from where we get the word Barmy, was established in the 15th century and, and later expanded and renamed Whitmore House. Holly House, now incorporated into St. Leonard's Hospital. Hoxton House, part of which remains in Hoxton Street, is 200 metres from where James practised. In 1810, he was asked to consult on a patient in nearby Exmouth Market, who was thought, incorrectly, to be mad, and was incarcerated against her will. These experiences moved him to write the manuscript, Madhouses, Observations on the Act for Regulating Madhouses, in which he attempted to distinguish disorders of memory, dysphasia, and true madness. He campaigned for the introduction of stricter safeguards for the patient and the doctor involved in certification of insanity and suggested for the first time that two independent physicians and the justice of the peace be required to certify insanity. In 1824, he published his last medical paper with his son, Dr. John Parkinson, on the treatment of infections and typhoid fever. John later collected and edited his father's early shorthand notes from his days as a medical student, and this collection was published in 1833 called Hunterian Reminiscences. In 1822, he was the recipient of the first honorary gold medal of the Royal College of Surgeons. 
James retired and moved to Three Pleasant Row off Kingston Road. In his final years, he concentrated on his geological interests. He died of a stroke on December the 21st, 1824, and was buried at St Leonard's Church, Shoreditch. No headstone marks his grave, but a marble plaque was placed in the church in 1955 by the staff of St Leonard's Hospital. James Parkinson hoped that the publication of an essay on the shaking palsy in 1817 might excite friends of humanity to extend their researches to this malady. The essay concludes with encouragement for those who were to follow him in the quest for a better understanding of the disease. Before concluding these pages, it may be proper to observe once more that an important object proposed to be obtained by them is the leading of the attention of those who humanely employ anatomical examination in detecting the causes and nature of diseases, particularly to this malady. By their benevolent labours, its real nature may be ascertained and appropriate modes of relief or even cure pointed out.